misdirecting God's mail. Prospective application. Although both retroactive and prospective misapplications discussed in the previous chapter are problematic, the consequences of the latter can be far more serious. For instance, seeking to put anyone under the law today for justification with God has sent and will send multitudes to hell. Furthermore, seeking to place Christians under the law stunts spiritual growth and robs them of God's intended rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. For those who know and love the truth, grasping why men would choose the schoolmaster, the law, over the Savior is incomprehensible. Galatians 3.24 says this, Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Although the errors resulting from prospective application are seemingly innumerable, we will focus on two widespread misapplications of these principles. The first concerns the Sabbath, and the second, the kingdom gospel. Number one, Sabbath observance. One of the prominent prospective misapplications concerns the Jewish Sabbath observance. The Jewish weekly Sabbath was part of the ceremonial law given by God through Moses for the Jews. Nehemiah 9.1 addressed the children of Israel and the history of their interactions with God and explains how God made known to them his Sabbath. Nehemiah 9.13 Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them, that is the children of Israel, from heaven, and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant. The Bible clearly states that God made known his holy Sabbath to the children of Israel. This Sabbath was to take place from sunset Friday night, about 6 p.m., to sunset on Saturday. Interestingly, the Sabbath was not instituted upon the nation of Israel until the time of Moses, which means that we have no record of Enoch, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, etc., ever observing the Sabbath. Repeatedly, we are told that God gave the Sabbath to Israel as a sign between him and them. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Ezekiel 20, verse 20. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. God repeatedly implemented the use of signs as he dealt with the Jews, so much so that Paul wrote that the Jews came to require a sign from God. 1 Corinthians 1.22, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The origins of this practice trace back to the Lord's interaction with Moses. Exodus 4.8, and it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that is the serpent rod, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign, the leprous healing. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. So the third sign is the water turned to blood. These initial signs were given because of Moses' unbelief and were repeated later to confirm his calling before the Jews in Egypt. Read Exodus 4, 1-9 for context. Signs, including the Sabbath, were for the Jews. This is why the Sabbath is neither a New Testament commandment nor a New Testament form of conduct for the church. It is both Jewish in origin and Jewish in application. Nowhere in the Bible are Christians told that this Sabbath ceremony is to be observed by the New Testament church. In fact, Paul had a great opportunity when he delineated five specific elements of the moral law in Romans 13.9. However, he conspicuously left off any mention of the Sabbath. Furthermore, Paul repeatedly testified that we, believers through faith in Christ, are not under the law. Romans 6.14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, 
but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Galatians 3.23, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Galatians 5.18, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. On page 107, the chart is titled, Christians Not Under the Law. If Christians are under the law and bound to keep the Sabbath, one would certainly expect to find the Sabbath a major point of emphasis in the church epistles. Yet we read just the opposite. For instance, the Sabbath took place upon the seventh day of the week, our Saturday, but the primary day of worship for Christians falls upon the first day of the week, Sunday. Some groups struggle with accepting that the church has no Sabbath because man wants these outward shows of submission in order to walk by sight rather than strictly by faith. For instance, the Seventh-day Adventists contend that Constantine, the Roman emperor in the 4th century, changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. This is simply a smokescreen resulting from spiritual infidelity and blindness to the truth. The church does not follow a Sabbath, whether on a Saturday or a Sunday. Yet the Bible does offer clear indications of a shift in emphasis to the first day of the week during the early church. 1. Sunday, Christ's resurrection. 2. Sunday, the Holy Ghost sent down to man. And 3. Sunday, primary church gathering day. A. Sunday, Christ's resurrection. God chose to leave Christ's body in the tomb through the Sabbath day, Saturday, and instead resurrected him from the grave the next day upon the first day of the week. It is significant that Christ's resurrection took place upon the first day of the week. This serves as a harbinger as to why we set aside that specific day of each week as a time for believers to gather together. See the chart on page 108 titled Sabbath Day versus Church's Day. Matthew 28, 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Verse 6. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. As noted, the resurrection took place after the Sabbath had ended, which also happened to be the first day of the Feast of First Fruits. This association of the resurrection with the first day of First Fruits is quite significant. This is because Corinthians tells us that Christ also became the first fruits of those who had already died. 1 Corinthians 15:20 But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. The Sabbath observance, the day prior to Christ's resurrection, signified the last day of the old creation. Matthew above used significant phraseology when it emphasized the words in the end of the Sabbath. The resurrection on Sunday testified to a new creation and a passing away of the old. Following Christ's resurrection, he appeared upon the earth for 40 days. He then ascended back to the Father. The day of Pentecost, recorded in Acts chapter 2, took place 10 days following this ascension. On that day, he sent the Holy Ghost down to man. Significantly, God chose to send the Holy Ghost down to man on the first day of the week. Interestingly, this is the event that triggered the empowerment of the budding church. B. Sunday, Holy Ghost sent down to man. According to Leviticus, the day of Pentecost always took place on the morrow after the Sabbath, or seven weeks after the first fruits and Christ's resurrection, Leviticus 23, 15, and 16. On Pentecost, the first day of the week, Sunday, the Holy Ghost was sent to earth to indwell believers. Acts 2, 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Israel's day was the Sabbath day, but God wanted the church to focus squarely upon the morrow after the Jewish Sabbath, that is, Sunday. This is why the church is focused upon the first day of the week for nearly two millennia. We are following the example of the early church, not some pronouncement by a council. The Sabbath pertained to Israel. The first day of the week pertains to the church. C. Sunday, primary church gathering day. Those who choose to ignore the first two shifts from the Sabbath emphasis 
to the first day of the week should find it much more difficult to disregard God for a third time. In Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, Paul instructed the believers to collect the offerings when the church gathered together. Take note that Paul also mentioned when they had these gatherings upon the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16.2 Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. These explicit instructions further reinforce the fact that things clearly transition from the Jewish Sabbath on the seventh day to the church's focus upon the first day of the week. On page 110, you'll find the chart, Sabbaths versus no Sabbath. A future warning for the Jews. Every Bible believer recognizes Israel and the church as two distinct entities and understands that the church does not replace Israel. Replacement theology. Additionally, we do not usurp the Jewish feast days, holy days, or Sabbath days. Our focus should be directed toward the New Testament emphasis found in the church epistles. The New Testament church age emphasis is squarely placed upon the first day of the week and not the Jewish Sabbath. The narrative found in Matthew chapter 24 serves as an additional proof text for Sabbath application to Israel as it pertains to the future time of Great Tribulation, Matthew 24, 21. Jesus foretold his followers that those in Judea during Daniel's 70th week would need to flee into the mountains. This will take place when they see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, Matthew 24, 15. That was spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Daniel 11.31, Daniel 12.11. The Lord expressed special warnings toward those who are with child and those carrying infants at that time. The Lord advised this specific prayer for those in focus at that time. Matthew 24.20 But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. The question for those who indiscriminately apply Scripture Should Christians be praying this prayer today? Of course not. The restoration of the nation of Israel is in view during the time of the fulfillment of this admonition. Matthew chapter 24 says nothing about the church or the blessed hope. This is because the blessed hope has already taken place years prior to the realization of this prophecy. Jesus foretold of a period following the church age when focus would once again revert back to the nation of Israel. That's why those who abide by the Sabbath and understand the Jewish law are advised to pray that their flight, fleeing from Judea, does not take place on the Sabbath day. It makes no sense for those who were never under the law to pray such a prayer as this. Should churches and Christians start praying that this prayer as they see the prophetic time clock winding to an end? Those present on earth when the abomination of desolation takes place need to seek an answer to their prayer during Daniel's 70th week. Why would the Jews find this prayer helpful? The Jews who know the rules of the Sabbath will understand that they have a limited travel distances during the Sabbath. The book of Acts offers a specific clue as to why this is so important for the Jews during this time. The distance from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives is a Sabbath day's journey. Acts 1.12 Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Based upon the combination of the truths taught concerning the suburbs in Numbers 35.5 and the Sabbath travel restrictions taught in Exodus 16.29, the Jews became convinced of the legitimacy of their travel limitations. The Sabbath day's journey was approximately 2,000 cubits or a little more than half a mile. This distance is easy to visualize for anyone who has traveled to Israel and stood on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem. The distance the Jew could travel when fleeing from the Antichrist upon the Sabbath day was from Jerusalem only as far as the Mount of Olives and no further. For those trying to safely escape the onslaught, this distance is not far enough since a greater distance would offer them greater protection. The church certainly does not need to be concerned with fleeing at the abomination of desolation, nor concerned about breaking Sabbath day requirements. Yet both of these issues will be of great importance to Israel in the future. The chart on page 112 is titled Jewish Sabbath Prayer. After the blessed hope, God is going to break the yoke off the neck of Israel and restore them to their rightful place of prominence. His chosen spokesman will be from the nation of Israel, not the church. 
The two witnesses representing the prophets, Elijah, and the law, Moses, will come and God will choose 144,000 male Jewish virgins to preach the gospel of the kingdom throughout the world, setting the stage for the end to come. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Footnote number one. See a later chapter for the identity of the two witnesses and justification for Elijah and Moses and not Enoch. Yet the church is not focused upon the gospel of the kingdom nor Israel's holy days. In fact, Paul calls any return to the religious observance of days as a weak and beggarly element and a means of inflicting spiritual bondage upon yourselves or others. Galatians 4.9 but now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desired again to be in bondage? Ye observe days, and months, and times, and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Verse 20, I desire to be present with you now, to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. On page 113, the chart is titled, Sabbath Shadow. The emphasis upon holy days by those of Galatia caused the Apostle Paul to fear that they were not even saved. He stood in doubt of them. The church was never intended to put this kind of emphasis on Sabbaths or holy days. True spiritual believers allow the scriptures to be their authority. In turn, they refuse to allow men to try to force Jewish regulations upon the church. The church has no commandment concerning adherence to the Sabbath day. For this reason, Paul wrote that no one is to judge believers concerning holy days, Sabbath days, and the like. Yet these days established by God for Israel under the Old Testament are described by Paul as a shadow of things to come. Colossians 2.16 Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. What is the sign? If the Sabbath was a sign to the Jews, what was its purpose? To what did it point? As demonstrated in numerous passages, the meaning of the word Sabbath is rest. Exodus 31.15, Leviticus 23.3, Leviticus 25.4. Here is one example, Exodus 16.23. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord has said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord, Bake that which ye will bake today, and seethe that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. On the Sabbath the Jews were to rest from earthly toils, Luke 23:56. It was to be a time of focused worship. However, this Sabbath sign was only temporary. The Sabbath was only a sign of better things to come, a shadow representing a time in the future of greater rest. Their initial rest pertain to their arrival in the land of promise, but their future rest will occur when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to establish his earthly kingdom. Hebrews 4, 1-10, a kingdom promised to the Jews. Kingdom Gospel Another erroneous but quite common teaching resulting from the prospective application is the suggestion that preachers today are to carry on an identical message as John the Baptist, the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the earliest ministry of the apostles. Although the subject will be covered in greater detail later in this work, its pervasive misapplication makes it necessary to introduce it here. Although Christ was not the first to preach the kingdom message, there is no doubt he did preach it. In fact, John was known as the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Mark 1, 3, until the jail cell silenced him. Afterwards, the Lord lifted up his voice like a trumpet and began to blow, Isaiah 58, 1. The Lord even suggested that the kingdom was at hand or within reach, Matthew 4:17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Unfortunately for Israel, this blinded nation rejected the Lord while the kingdom was within their grasp. In envy, they chose to crucify their king, Mark 15.10. Due to Israel's rejection of their Messiah, the kingdom would not be offered until after the fullness of the Gentiles, which takes place after the closing of this church age. Romans 11.25 for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, 
that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. It is important to note that the kingdom is a synonymous designation for the thousand-year millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, a time yet to come. Revelation 20, verse 4. The Spokesman for the Kingdom Gospel. Matthew 4, verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Not only did Jesus preach the gospel of the kingdom during his earthly ministry, but he likewise instructed his apostles and disciples to follow his example. They too preached the gospel of the kingdom and told their listeners that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Matthew 10, verse 7. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Peter was one such preacher. During the early part of his ministry, his primary focus was not concerned with preaching the death, burial, and resurrection, also known as the gospel, the grace of God, Acts 20, 24. In fact, as we have already seen, he did not even understand the cross prior to Christ's resurrection. He was not alone in this lack of understanding. None of the apostles understood Christ's sacrifice on the cross. They preached what they knew, and the reason for Christ's crucifixion was not known until after the resurrection. Therefore, their messages focused upon the announcement of the promised kingdom to the Jewish nation. The chart on page 116 is titled, The Kingdom Preaching. The chart depicts how the gospel of the kingdom was preached. However, the actual onset of the kingdom would not materialize until thousands of years later following the second coming. We know that almost 2,000 years have transpired since the Lord's first coming and the preaching recorded in the four Gospels. The Implications of the Kingdom Gospel No God-called preacher today who understands and believes the Bible preaches the Kingdom Gospel. The differing features between this Gospel and the Gospel of the Grace of God are readily apparent. Later studies will examine the critical distinctions between these two Gospels in greater detail. Understanding the difference between the kingdom gospel and the gospel preached today would resolve many schisms, divisions, and even heresies facing the church today. For instance, the kingdom gospel included the healing of all manner of sickness and disease as a sign to the nation of Israel. Matthew 9:35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Mark 1.14 Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Mark 16.20 And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Context is of paramount importance in order to understand these doctrinal difficulties. The Gospel books, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, proclaim the kingdom's various features. The kingdom gospel emphasized in these three synoptic gospels will be preached when God again focuses his primary attention toward the Jews. We must consider the time period covered. We are not supposed to read someone else's mail as though it is written directly for us to follow. The church will be taken out of this world at the blessed hope. At that time, the message to Israel, the gospel of the kingdom, will resume. According to Matthew, the kingdom gospel must be preached in all the world before the end comes. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The end referred to in Matthew chapter 24 refers to the period of time during Daniel's 70th week before the second coming. This end is contingent upon the full preaching of the gospel of the kingdom and not contingent upon the preaching of the gospel now preached. The whole world will hear the gospel of the kingdom prior to the end, the second coming. Paul provides additional proof that this is not the same gospel as we preach or as he preached. Our gospel has already been preached in all the world, Colossians 1, verses 5 and 6, and to every creature, Colossians 1, 23. If it were the same gospel, the end would have already come by now. Let's read the verses. Colossians 1, 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye have heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, 
which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Colossians 1.23, If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. On page 118, the chart is titled, The Kingdom Gospel. Conclusion. The last two chapters have exposed the dangers of retroactive and prospective misapplication. The teachings resulting from these erroneous practices are endless and are easily recognizable by simply turning on most religious broadcasts. It is not enough to know the truth. We must consistently and consciously check ourselves to ensure that we are not guilty of incorporating unscriptural principles into our Bible study and Bible applications. Our full allegiance must be to the Savior and to His Scripture and nothing else. We now turn our attention toward another of the insidious teachings, that of replacement theology. This is the end of chapter 7.